Hello and welcome to Seattle City Makers. I'm your host, John Scholes. Well, happy May, everybody, and uh, it, it finally feels like spring, and I think we're all grateful for the warmer weather and uh, bluer skies that graced us this past weekend in Seattle and finally touching the, the 70s, and hopefully this is a sign of more spring-like and uh, summer-like weather to come, but what a brisk few months it's been, but we're hardy souls. We'll survive, uh, us Northwesterners, but good to have some more spring-like weather uh, grace us in the last few days. It feels good. Well, welcome to today's episode where I sit down with Mark Dones, who's the new CEO of the King County Regional Homelessness Authority, the first CEO of this authority that was created in December of 2019 by local governments within our community to be the central clearinghouse and entity responsible for our community's response to the crisis of homelessness and a crisis that was with us prior to the pandemic and a crisis that in many ways uh, the pandemic has exacerbated. The authority is beginning to stand up its efforts and take responsibility and ownership of uh, contracts for housing and services within our community and to really coordinate and lead the response and the interventions to bring more people off the streets in Seattle and in other parts of King County. Mark Dones took over the role as CEO in April of 2021, was the consultant that uh, was hired back in 2018 to design the authority. Didn't want the job originally, uh, but ended up applying and was hired uh, about a year ago. And uh, Mark and their team have been building the infrastructure in the organization and have uh, recently announced that their first area of focus uh, will be addressing the crisis in downtown Seattle, a crisis where we have roughly 800 people in the greater downtown uh, living unsheltered on the streets and in other public areas, a concentration of individuals experiencing homelessness that is greater than any other community within King County. And back in February, uh, Mark and their team, along with the philanthropic sector and a number of private companies, announced a new effort, Partnership for Zero, to scale up a response to the crisis in downtown. We talk about that and much, much more in our conversation from the Yesler Building in downtown Seattle, the new home and offices of the King County Regional Homelessness Authority. Hope you enjoy my conversation with Mark Domes. Well, thanks for doing this. No problem. Um, thanks for having me. And you've been uh, really gracious with your time with us at the Downtown Seattle Association. I got I COVID think. at one of the things that I was gracious with my time with. Uh oh. Yeah, I got it at the one of the in-person gatherings. Yeah. Yeah. Because then, then I couldn't go to the regional leadership conference. That's right. You were supposed to be up there, and yeah. you were on the bill, and I was. I made it. Oh. Did you take a test? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have COVID. I didn't have COVID. <laughs> but thank thank goodness for our vaccines, right? That is true. How have your COVID experiences been? I so I've had it twice this year. One time I caught it working a shelter shift, and uh, the other time I I caught it, you know, public speaking. Which I mean, you know as far as like reasons to catch it, both solid. First time, definitely worse. I'm sorry, second time, worse than the first. Like, I think mm -hmm. like if I'm understanding what I'm reading <laughs> correctly, then like it has to do with strains. Like it's not actually, like it's just like the flu, right? Where it's like, yeah. you know, you get vaccinated and you hope that like your vaccine is for the right strains. And like a little bit of that is just statistical modeling and what are the strains going to be? So I think, you know, when I uh, caught it again, it was just a different strain. And that one, that one felt like, like, like a really significant, like chest cold, you mm -hmm. know, but I felt, I mean, you know, vaccines, right. I didn't go to the hospital Yep. and I'm here right now. They're working. <laughs> like, so like, yay, <laughs> vaccines. Yeah. I think one of the most underappreciated scientific discoveries of our time were those, yeah. are those vaccines because they're. They continue to do amazing work, and we've gotten it, but neither you nor I have had to go to the hospital. And I think that's the thing that people and lots of other people don't like fully grasp, right? Because people are still like, "Oh, I got it, so the yeah. vaccine doesn't yeah. work." And it's like, "But you didn't go to the hospital." Yeah, like that's actually the thing we're trying to stave off, right? Is like, yep. If you can get, if you can l get it, and then lay at home in your bed and get better. Everything worked as designed. Dr. Vim Gupta in episode four, just to plug some previous guests, uh, talks a little bit about that. I think episode mm. four, episode three, four, one of those. But we're grateful you're here. Uh, we owe you extra for your appearance at the State of Downtown, where it sounds as though you got COVID. And we thank you in advance for your 
appearance virtually on an event we're doing in a couple of weeks. Oh, that's right. Where yeah. you shouldn't get COVID at that one, I don't think. Well, okay. If I do, it would be my own fault. It could be. <laughs> so before we jump in, I mean, you've been in Seattle a little over, or a little less than a year, in the role a little over a year. Yep. What are you enjoying about the city? What's your Seattle story about just moving to a new place in the middle of a pandemic with a big job? I love this city. I love this region. And I wouldn't have taken this job if that wasn't already true. Did you know Seattle fairly well before you ventured out from Ohio? I wouldn't say I knew it fairly well, but I like when I was doing the design work, I spent a lot of time here, yeah. right? The design of the the regional homelessness authority. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I I would say that like I had definitely developed like a pre pandemic like walking knowledge, right? Like I I knew downtown. I was I was living in Belltown actually, like half time, and then you know I knew Capitol Hill. Like I you know I had neighborhood understandings of those of those places. And then I just think that there's something like, you know, from like Portland to Vancouver, like something magical is happening. And like, you just know that, like, as soon as you like look out a window, I mean, my office like looks out, you know, and you can see portions of the sound and the mountains, right? Yeah. And so it's like, you know, there's there's something humbling and stabilizing about that view to be like, my problems are small. <laughs> These things are ancient and will outlive all of us, yeah. right? Um, we're still feeling the frontier here, you know? Right. And I think, you know, so so in that aspect, like moving here has been has been fantastic. Like I I um am really looking forward to to more spring, more summer, seeing it's not more stuff usually with my partner. This bad. I know. It's not usually this and bad. And I've had to say that to my partner too. Cause, you know, anyone who spends any time in Seattle is like, wait until spring, summer. Like these yeah. months are beautiful. And so I keep pro- I've promised May a lot, and now I'm having to promise <laughs> June. <laughs> yeah. So move the ball. No, June's going to be great. Yeah. June's going to be great. Yeah. It'll be fantastic. And if not, July 5th. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even for those of us that have lived here a while, this has been a tough spring. I read but it's La Nina. I don't know what it is. This is, is that, cold and blustery. Yeah. I yeah. read, I read that like there's a, a La Nina, which I, I believe is when the ocean is colder. And La Nino, or El Nino, rather, is when it is warmer. Yeah, I think all bad weather gets blamed on one of those, though. It's just yeah. like, you know, we're out of sorts one way or the other. I said that to my partner, and he said, don't they happen every year? And I was like, no, <laughs> I don't know, actually. <laughs> I'm still holding out hope for the summer, though. We're going to yeah. have a great summer. I think so, too. I've noticed, even in the last couple of days, like when I'm heading down to Pioneer Square, things like that, like people are out more already. Yeah. Um, and that's really nice to see. What's your sense of the hill? I mean, the hill doesn't stop. From what I can tell, it only had like a couple significant closures over the course of the pandemic. Like, you know, it's it's bars and restaurants and, and you know, people are out. Yeah. We're, um, all, we're all still eating and drinking and yeah. going to hear music. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. It seemed like a neighborhood that bounced back a little faster than some of, some of our other ones. But good to see people out generally kind of all over yeah. the city. So a year into the role, and it was one that you sort of designed, or you, you designed the authority, and then the authority needed a CEO, but it was a role you didn't want. Do I have that right originally? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. When, I did, you, when, when did you decide you wanted the, the responsibility? What changed? December 2020, it would have been. I just saw, you know, the agency had essentially been wireframed and put on a shelf. I tuned into a couple board meetings and was like, oh, no, I think... Want is a strong word, but I think I I felt really strongly like, you know, the community had put a lot of work into the design of the agency, the priorities Mm -hmm. of the agency. There was a real shot at doing something different, at being um, successful at, um, you know, our community's, I would say, most pressing problem. And the idea of that not happening because we just couldn't get a leader. I mean, like that's, I mean, that's, it wasn't okay with, you know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. so it's like, if I had to be that person for a period of time so that like we could get going and make sure that we actually were able to succeed at this, then Mm -hmm. like, you know, sure. And I, I will say I haven't had that many regrets. I mean, it has not been uh, easy by any stretch of the imagination, but how many people get to do a government startup? Like a mm-hmm. real government mm-hmm. startup. I was talking with our chief administrative officer the other day, and like, I don't think people realize how much of a startup we were. Like, we stopped using public internet in December. 
You're off on your own. Yeah, like go find your own internet. Yeah, provider. I mean, yeah. but like it, it, the we are running a startup out of sort of somebody's garage vibe. Yeah, <laughs> it was like very strong for a couple months yeah. there, but it's been good. What don't people understand about this issue? I mean, it's, so it's a top issue in the city, right? And you, you're well aware of that, and others are too. You know, you do all kinds of research and polling, and it's the issue that gives you most concern is this one on the top of minds of voters. And so there's all this talk about it. It's it's whether it's in your own neighborhood or in the press with elected officials. But what do you think people miss about understanding the issue and the crisis of homelessness? What people miss is just the base economics, right? Like I think people forget that it is possible to have a significant psychiatric condition and not lose your housing because you have enough money to stay housed, right? Like, and that for the vast majority of folks who are experiencing homelessness, the story into homelessness is just economics. There are many things that might have happened after that, including the onset of psychiatric conditions. We often see um, the trauma of homelessness causes psychotic breaks and other things, right? Causes substance use. You know, I've talked with a number of people who start using meth as a safety thing, right? Like mm. they they uh, literally are like, I needed to figure out a way to stay up all night so I was safe. <laughs> and meth will do that. Safe being out on the mm-hmm. on the streets. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so that they don't get victimized by um by some of our actual criminal element, right? And you know, but the economics are are often the precursor. And I, I would say that is true in in truly like 90% of, of cases. And we really misunderstand the economic help that is available, right? So we have over-indexed on a system that offers a lot of subclinical supports. And, you know, you and I have had long conversations about the need to have true clinical support, right? Um, But currently we have a lot of, of, um, you know, case management, not a lot of, you know, actual like diagnostic and then, you know, here is the medicine that you need, Mm -hmm. et cetera. And um, we don't have the economic pathways that people need. And I don't just mean jobs, although certainly for some folks, uh, workforce development and employment strategies are, are going to be key. But many of the folks who are experiencing homelessness are currently employed. They're just underemployed, right? Um, and that's about a broader economic framework. Um, we also see, um, you know, I was uh, just writing up my, my budget memo for FY23, And one of the things that we note there is that, you know, a lot of folks who are experiencing homelessness with vehicles, um, particularly cars and RVs, right, are older. Mm -hmm. um, And some of uh, those folks, you know, will talk about how they enter into homelessness and choose uh, uh, vehicular homelessness because the shelters, you know, are uh, not humane, um, although we're doing work to, to transform that. And you know, they've got SSI or disability or something. And it's just, it's never going to pay the rent. It'll pay for gas though, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So like, so so people make the choices that are left to them. And that's the part that I I feel like is often missing from the conversation is like, so much of this is rooted in this idea that people experiencing homelessness are choosing the wrong things. And what I find quite disheartening is, is that we don't understand that like we've actually made the choice for them, right? Like with the with the society that we've structured and where we put our values and our budgets. And we could choose differently, but it would have to be a choice. Mm-hmm. And we'd all have to make it. Well, and speaking of doing things differently, I mean, the RHA that you're leading is really intended to take a different approach. How would you characterize for maybe the cynical public? What's different? What's the essence that's different in in the approach that the RHA is taking than what we've been doing? I think um, two things are, are really different. And the first I would say is, you know, the, the real uh, centering and elevation of lived expertise. And I've had um, housing instability. I've been involuntarily hospitalized twice. About 50% of the staff here has lived experience. Mm -hmm. Um, We partner with the lived experience coalition on like everything that we do. And there's a way that that gets understood as like an an ethical thing or a moral thing, Um, you know, sort of like, you know, nothing about us without us. And all that is important. From my perspective, what we really need to be saying when we say, and there's a reason why I say, you know, lived expertise instead of just lived experience, although I think both of those are important, is that there are things that I know how to do because of those things I have experienced, Mm -hmm. right? Like, 
I know how to design a program that like centers healing through dignity because I've been in one that did that and one that didn't. And I know, and like I can literally point to the architectural differences mm-hmm. in program that like created that sense of, of um, how to move forward, how to uh, heal. And many of us um, who've been in some of those, you know, more unpleasant spaces carry with us that same ability to rather quickly diagnose and redesign mm-hmm. something so that it can function in a different way. And then the second thing is just like data. Like, like I'm a social scientist. Like much of my team, um, you know, comes from a, uh, a lot of them come actually from the provider space. Um, you know, my chief program officer has been doing public administration for like, you know, 30-ish years. Like we're a very data-driven shop. And so our first question whenever we look at something is not like, how do I feel about it? But like, what does the data say about mm-hmm. this? Um, and so when we are, uh, when we feel, uh, you know, when we lift up something or when we say like, maybe take a pause on that, there is always going to be like a, a a dashboard or, you know, some statistics or some like, you know, what is the cost per exit? Like, those are all things that like, if anyone asks us like, well, why aren't you a big fan of this model? Like, we can just rattle those things off, right? Um, and so I think it's really important that like, you know, as we move forward with redesigning the system, we do it based on best practices that we know work and where we need to, you know, be innovative or where we need to sort of drive towards something that is emergent, the data should take us there rather than our feelings. How do you how do you determine though, I hear you on the importance of data, but how do you determine what data matters most, right? I mean, the public is out there saying frustrated and impatient and why aren't we making more progress and we keep voting for to spend more money and we're generous with our investment and and they're sort of calling on a more urgent response, both for their own interests and the health of their neighborhood or park, but I think also given who Seattleites are, they, they're a compassionate bunch and they want to see folks struggling in the park or on the sidewalk uh, in a better situation than they've seen them in for many months or years. So how do you square sort of the public's desire for a more urgent response and then a set of data metrics and criteria that you could construct that could tell you all sorts of things, but maybe doesn't align with the public's interest and objective. I mean, we can just cut right to the debate on tiny homes, right? I mean, so there's been a conversation in the press over the last couple of weeks, and you all have had perspective, and other folks who are producing tiny homes and running villages have had perspectives. And it's sort of centered to some degree on the issue that, you know, I was noting of this, what's the criteria and the set of data that we're holding up as most important? So from my perspective, and I, I think from the perspective of this team, like you always have to weave two things together in order to understand what matters, right? There's the quantitative uh, data that you can get when you say like, what's the length of stay? How long does this cost versus this other thing? Like, you know, that those are, are pretty standard administrative ways to like sort of look at a program and analyze mm-hmm. its efficacy. But then you also have to include, and this is, I think, where again, I think we're different, and maybe also in part because I'm an anthropologist, but also I think because of, you know, what the ILA says and and how we're sort of authored into existence, there's this question of like, how do people experience this thing, right? And, you know, what I can say sitting here, right, is when you look across our system, across all program types, there's a 40% exit rate to permanent housing from like anything. So if you touch a thing, right, there is a 40% chance that you're going to wind up with a permanent housing exit. 60% do not exit to permanent housing. Not fantastic. And when we talk to people about like, you know, sort of what unwound for you here, it is very often the experience of the of the thing, right? Mm-hmm. So like we This have could be heard, a congregate shelter, a tiny home. Yes. A hotel room that might be yes. in service for Exactly. Yeah. So we've heard for gosh, 20 years that congregate shelter is inhumane. And shockingly, it produces an 18% exit rate to permanent housing. It's our lowest performing piece of the portfolio, right? So it's like, so if if 15 years ago, 17 years ago, we had just listened to what people said about the thing, we wouldn't have spent, it's also, you know, it is the largest expenditure in our entire portfolio mm-hmm. also, right? 
So if we had just listened to people back when they said, this is inhumane, it is disincentivizing to use, I don't feel safe here, like all those things, the cus- right? Listen to the customer and the client of exactly. folks who are using it, yeah. Then, then, which is how every other, you know, how, that's how the private sector runs everything that mm-hmm. is successful. They just kind of listen to what people say and then they do that thing, right? For whatever reason, you know, this part of the public sector has been exempt from that. And the the results are quite clear, right? Like you take something that people all say they hate, you look at how it performs, and it's the lowest performing thing. And, you know, what I understand to be true is that the tiny homes uh, were the only non-congregate option for, uh, you know, five, six years, right? So their popularity, I think, is in line with the fact that there was nothing else happening, right? What I now, you know, uh, not now believe to be true, what I what I simply just believe to be true is that like the pandemic has changed a lot of things. And one of those things is how we can do shelter. And so we now have other ways to produce non-congregate shelter through hotel motel acquisition, through SRO, through, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, retrofitting of uh, existing spaces that have served other uh, needs, et cetera, et cetera. And as uh, what we hear now, right, when we talk to folks is hotel room or tiny home, right? People are smart. They'll choose the thing that is the most dignity-based for them. And so, you know, what, what I would say is that the question is not, should we do more tiny homes? The question is, should we only do mm-hmm. more tiny homes? And this, I think, is the thing that I've, I've been a little frustrated by, is that my reticence to expand tiny homes by a, a, a factor of 10, like a, add a thousand more of mm-hmm. them to the system— has not been rooted in, and we shouldn't open anything else, right? It has been, what are the other non-congregate options we could pursue that we would be able to open just as quickly, if not faster, that again, could provide people with a dignity-based solution to their experience of unsheltered homelessness. And that, I think, has to be where where we're at right now as a system, is it's never a... It's never a no. The question is always, it's, it's going to be a yes and, and we should be thinking about how much of each thing, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so we have about 500 beds, actually closer to 600 now, of tiny home-based shelter. We don't have nearly that much in SRO or hotel-motel conversion, right? So what I think we need to be focused on is ramping up that kind of non-congregate shelter mm-hmm. as well, right? We need to be focused on ramping up high acuity supports. Like there are there are things we need to be focused uh, on bringing online and scaling, and that's the kind of a conversation we need to be having. So so it's not a uh, a desire to not open more. I and mean, we just funded two villages and then a third, right? Like. The answer is not no here, Just right? level of emphasis. It's a level of emphasis. Yeah. And you think we move away completely from the congregate shelter model? Or is there still a role for the you know, the 100-person shelter with bunk beds that you might just be there for a night or two? Although history has said, you know, people are there for... Much longer. M- much, much, much longer. Yeah. But do you think, does that go completely away because of what we've learned during the pandemic and all that you've said of, hey, it's not the preferred place that people want to be and they're probably going to choose the tent or the sidewalk and for a lot of different reasons instead of that? I think over the next uh, several years, we move towards that going almost entirely away, right? Not immediately. We need to we need to phase out of it. We need to recognize that in the immediate, it's no longer medically safe, right? So like, even uh, even the congregate spaces that do still operate have to be de- de-intensified, right? So the number of people who can be there is significantly lower. But I do think ultimately that is a shelter type that that we phase out over the next couple of years. I think, you know, one thing that you said, I, which is the, the reason why I would say we, you know, would maintain a small stock of it is there's always a thing you need the night of, right? Like, mm-hmm you know, your house burns down and we don't have anything for you the night of, we need some place for you that night. But ideally, um, to your point, the, um, you know, the stay should be a day or two. And then like, you know, we're, we are so focused on getting you into something that is non-congregate, dignity-based, going to set you up to move uh, to uh, a permanent housing uh, option, right? That we're really, really moving quite quickly. And as you noted, right, the average length of stay right now in that uh, portfolio subsection is 100, 
118 days, I want to say. I should double check mm-hmm. that, but I'm pretty sure it's 118 mm-hmm. days. Um, and that's on average, right? Um, and again, with an 18% permanent housing exit rate. So it's like people stay there for, you know, quarter of a year, half a year, in some cases much longer. And then, you know, they... they just right. might exit right back to the streets or the exactly. park or, yeah. Yeah. And ag- again, right, like we can look across our portfolio and look like, what is the percentage of people exiting to permanent housing? And that has to guide our decisions about investment. Do you attribute the reliance on congregate shelter to some of the slow progress we've made in this region and in, in demonstrating results around this issue on the street? Have we been sort of over, over-invested and over-indexed to congregate shelter over the last, you know, five, ten years? I think it's a really good question. And... And to be honest, I my perspective is that it's not about this community. It's about our national inability to reconcile like our our values with our housing market and whether or not we have those values, right? To be honest, because we talk a good game about how homelessness shouldn't exist, but we don't invest the way that we should, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you know, our final budget for uh, this fiscal year was, around $170 million when you factored in, you know, COVID relief money and philanthropic stuff and and our partnership for zero work, right? It was the McKinsey analysis that noted that we needed to be spending somewhere between $450 million and $1.1 billion annually. On housing production. In order to, yes, yeah. between, between the homelessness services and yeah. the housing production, that was the combined figure, right? Um, and that we needed to be doing that every year in order to get out of the hole that we're in, right? Now, I think there's a lot to be said about, like, can our revenue streams even create that amount of money? And the answer is no. Not dedicated anyway. Like, every city and many of the large counties and, you know, are are wrestling with this same issue. Um, And it's because we're, you know, 30 to 40 years behind the eight ball at sort of, like, not doing it, right? And instead, what we have done, uh, and again, this is not just uh, King County. But we have repeatedly stood up these these, uh, large congregate options and said, like, this is where you can go. Um, And I guess my perspective, you know, sort of locks in it. I'm I'm just concerned that we, I don't think we like poor people in this country, you know? And like, and I say that as a person who, like, I, you know, I always say I have a reverse Cinderella story. Like, I had a lot of money until I was 10. And (laughs) And then we lost it. Um, and I spent a lot of my teen years, um, like literally ducking behind furniture with my mom to hide from from repo men. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I watched them tow away uh, our car um, and worry how I was going to get to school in the morning. Right? Like th- that is like I have I have lived through that experience. I have lived through couch surfing because I didn't have anywhere to be, and I have never stayed in a shelter because I knew without knowing, I mean, I wasn't working in homelessness then. I just knew that was like going to be bad, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so I think that this, this for me, this, this question um, of uh, how can we do better, you know, again, it, like the, the centering people with lived expertise is, is not just about like uh, this moral thing, but it is about like how do we build better stuff even with the revenue that we have. And we have built congregate things that are not dignity-based, that are humiliating to be in, that are often uh, have intense rates of violence in them. And then we kind of said, we don't care. Mm -hmm. And we've done that for 30 years. It's no provider's fault. It is just, it is the policy decision we have made. And it took a pandemic in many ways to sort of shake all that up, right? So you've you've said you're going to focus initially on the crisis in downtown Seattle where we've got 800 or so folks living unsheltered, 800 folks in the greater downtown, at least living unsheltered and a majority of those folks on the street more than, more than a year and dealing with substance use and mental health, other behavioral health issues. And you, you noted earlier partnership for zero is sort of what you're terming it um, in this neighborhood and then other neighborhoods where you'd replicate it. What's what kind of status report can you, give us on on sort of where that effort stands? Uh, we've hired um, four uh, co-directors of what um, 
our peer navigation program, which will, is actually uh, has undergone its own branding. So those are now called our, our system advocates. We've also got a operations and policy director. Um, and I sent an email this morning to schedule a meeting to review um, 10 or 15 candidates who are um, uh, the top uh, selections to become team leads. Um, and then we'll hire out the, the teams themselves. Um, so we should have boots on the ground in June. Um, starting to do that, like by name list development to understand, uh, you know, who needs what, um, and begin to, to support people in, you know, getting access to, to whatever the right things are. Um, as you noted, um, you know, I, I, I continue to think that there are, are, you know, a, a number of folks who are living in the downtown core who have, um, significant behavioral health needs. Um, and we don't have good data on what the number, like what that number is, mm -hmm. right? If I just sort of look at, um, you know, there's a, a good uh, paper on some meta-analysis of prevalence of uh, psychotic disorders in people experiencing homelessness um, that I was looking at the other day, and it clocked in at like 21.1%, right? Um, so if we use that as our, our baseline, then we're looking at, you know, a hundred-ish people who are going to need pretty significant care. And as, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, as a county, we only have 200 residential treatment beds, mm -hmm. right? So this is part of the reason why, you know, I continue to make the case for, um, and I'm working with the county to stand up a, a, a high acuity shelter option, and we need to stand up more, right? The future of services for folks experiencing homelessness in this region has to be differentiated. Um, and when I say that, what I mean is like, you should be able to get the right service type for whatever you need, yeah. right? And currently what folks uh, essentially move through is, a, you know, you, you're uh, unsheltered, you can go to shelter, and then you go to PSH, right? That's kind, that's kind of like- Permanent supportive housing. Yes. For, yeah. That's kind of all we got. Yeah. Um, and what we're talking about on this team right now is how do we have, you know, low acuity community living, uh, PSH as is, recovery housing, harm reduction housing, long-term assisted li like Like folks experiencing homelessness fall into like need ranges in all these spaces. And only by differentiating the system to actually have the right service intensity level so that folks can find their, their yeah. right fit are we actually going to solve this. It seems like the public is is there in understanding the complexity of this issue and the needs of folks on the street. And it seems like the system is maybe slower to respond to provide it. I think that's right. And I think, you know, the unfortunate thing that is just true, um, and until we adopt wholesale, like, different governance models, right? Like, um, I have a colleague who works for the federal government who always says, you know, system uh, change is a bit like turning a freighter around out at sea, right? And so you do it like degree by degree. And those degrees can be, like they can make a big difference in terms of like, you know, uh, uh, the, the journey as it stands. But ultimately that wholesale turnaround takes time. Um, and that's really what, what we're doing, right? Like we're going from a one size fits all, you know, you should be lucky. You should consider yourself lucky you got this, right? Mm -hmm. To a dignity based, differentiated, um, articulated model of support, and it's going to take time to to uh, develop that and and um, build that up. And so, you know, I think that the question that's on my mind every day, um, and uh, you know, frankly, is worth a town hall or six. Is like, <laughs> what do we do along the way? Mm -hmm. Right? Like what, like what is our what are our stop gaps while we do that turnaround? Right. Um, because the present reality is unacceptable. Um, and we know we can do better. Um, but we need to make some very serious policy decisions about what will the interim states be. Um, and we need to have a map we all agree on and that we know is is how we're doing that together. Um, and I think it is often that space that causes the most strife. Because uh, we can all, to your point, agree that there is a, a, a star on a hill, so to speak, that we're headed towards. But what is between 
now and then mm -hmm. is where we fall apart. And everybody's impatient, exactly. least of all the folks suffering outside, right? That have yes. been waiting for some time. Would you characterize that shift as sort of one from we're sacrificing some amount of quantity for quality in what we're able to offer? And we've sort of over-indexed to the, the quantity of, hey, we can help a lot of people at the downtown big congregate shelter for, you know, 300 people we can pack in there. Mm. But we're not going to move a lot of them into permanent supportive housing. A lot of them are going to be there for several months and they might, most of them might probably just end up back on the streets. Are we, are we making a conscious choice to sort of sacrifice a bit of quantity as far as spaces for quality ones that may have better long-term impacts for folks? That's a, a really good question. To be honest and not to be rude, I don't know that we're even sacrificing quantity for quality because as I, I've looked at the data and, you know, from um, 2018 to now, the bed contraction that COVID generated was, I mean, there was a bed contraction, but it wasn't massive. It wasn't like, it, you know, it wasn't like we lost thousands of beds. Mm -hmm. We did lose a couple hundred and then we were rapidly able to gain yeah. them back, yeah. right? So I think this is one of those things where it really is just a question of like, how creative have we been? And like, you know, again, like what is the level of dignity that we're trying to design around, right? Because like, you know, for the same cost as, you know, opening some of the the uh, shelters that that we are familiar with, I can master lease a hotel. It's the same amount of money. It's just what we've allowed ourselves to think is possible, right? If I, you know, some of the investments that we've made in terms of, um, you know, uh, development, right, certainly could have been put into acquisition. But, you know, again, we were really fixated on the development model. Build, as build the, a new stuff. Yeah, yeah, build new stuff. Yeah. Well, and you having, you saying all that, we should credit, you know, the county and county executive Constantine, right, with this big health through housing yep. initiative over the last year or so that's allowed the yes. county to go to go acquire a bunch of yeah, facilities that aren't congregate shelters. Director Floor, I think, yeah. actually, you know, laid out and executed a really brilliant strategy to bring a whole bunch of beds into the system and rapidly convert them into permanent supportive yeah. housing. And and again, right, it it was it was focused on taking a step back and thinking about like there is a there is a fast way to generate quality stuff, but you have to take your head out of the traditional government mindset and frankly, play a little bit more like a business. Yeah. And you, uh, so you're running a regional authority and you've got, you know, leaders from across King County that are your governing board, but you made a decision early on to focus on downtown as one of these partnership for zero neighborhoods. How, how, and, and why? I mean, I know we asked you to, but I think it was more than just our great persuasion. <laughs> <laughs> but so how how did you make that decision knowing that you've got folks in Auburn and Kent and you know north of Seattle other parts of the community that want to see just the same amount of progress that we do downtown It was the data it was it was this is the highest concentration of chronically unsheltered people in the county and being very clear that if we you know, we're going to be driven by a, a, you know, a fierce urgency. We should, you know, let that urgency then also draw us to where the humanitarian crisis that we're facing was at the worst, right? And, and you know, in talking it through with my team, you know, one of the things that my chief program officer and I said to each other at one point was like, even if we only housed 40 or 50% of the folks, that's, that's still, I mean, like, there's kind of no way to lose this from a just helping people perspective, right? Like, you know, sure, the public narrative, you know, would say, well, you said 800 and you only did 400. And I would say, and we did 400. Like mm -hmm. 400 people don't sleep outside, mm -hmm. right? Like, so that was really the driver for us is, is there is nowhere else in the county that you see this scale. And I think, you know, wanting to, you know, figure out, you know, inside this pilot, what we could replicate, right? So like the, the goal is to, you know, uh, be successful, but also to work out whatever the kinks are, and then to be able to expand not just to other neighborhoods in Seattle, but to other jurisdictions, yep. right? Where sometimes the, the homelessness crisis isn't as, as visible, but it's certainly there relative to downtown Seattle, right? That's right. And, you know, we've, we've just um, concluded our, our point in time count, which we, we um, pretty significantly modified uh, this year um, in order to pursue a different method that I think is a little bit sharper from a statistics perspective. And, you know, 
while the point in time count is is bad data, it can certainly be used as a as a uh, bellwether, so to speak. And um, unsheltered homelessness by the point in time count is up thirty eight percent in King County. Yeah, yeah. And how is that done differently now than it used to be done? There, am I correct that there's some changes in kind of the methodology to how we understand and yeah. account for who's outside? So we made some pretty significant uh, methods uh, changes. Um, and so we used um, a method called respondent-driven sampling, which you know is a method where you um, you know if I interviewed uh, or if I you know connect with you, John, then I ask you to refer in three people, right? And then I ask those three people to refer in three people, right? So each wave in the sample gets larger. And our our goal, right, um, was to, you know, by wave three, four, be talking to people who were experiencing unsheltered homelessness and also didn't really use services. Hmm. Because the other thing we attached to this was a, a qualitative dimension where we collected oral histories from all these folks, right? So we uh, set up nine hubs across the county with the you know preliminary goal based on modeling of saying like okay can we get close to a thousand you know touch points we got um, a little bit north of six hundred we preliminarily think that there may have been some undersampling in some spaces um, but that undersampling doesn't um, undercut the statistical model mm-hmm. right mostly what it causes me to have concern around is. You know, I don't think we heard from enough people in this subregion, and so I don't think we still. I don't think we understand their experience the way that we need to, right? So we we got all this input through the hubs. We we take the the uh, quantitative data, right? Like the you know referrals and how long the the chains were through the the waves, et cetera. Hand that over to a statistician at, at UW who then models out. Okay, so based on who you came into contact with and where and how long these res- these you know respondent chains were etc hmm. this is the number that i think is you know i have the highest confidence uh interval in right that number is is north of 7000 the previous point in time counts were in the the 5000 like 5500 5300 range right so it is a a 38% jump yeah and i'll be honest i don't think it's just the methods that I, like you know i think yes the methods are sharp as a social scientist i care a lot about methods I feel like I can hang a hat on this in a different way. And I think that it has just gone up. And the impacts of the pandemic economically and otherwise would exactly lead us to conclude that's the case along with the data, right? Yep. And and the thing that, you know, I will say, right, is so we have now um, about 500 oral histories. Um, not everyone who we came in contact with provided an oral history. You know, we have those 500 oral histories. And one of the things that I'm I'm really excited about is that's the largest collection of qualitative data from people who are currently unsheltered, I think, ever. I'm going to verify that, but I don't think anyone has ever done this on this scale. And what that means is that we can uh, analyze that data for all kinds of things, right? Like what services are missing from Mm -hmm. the system, right? Those were explicit questions we asked. What were pathways into homelessness? What is, you know, what's missing to help people get out of homelessness? What are their experiences with violence? What are their experiences with the criminal legal system? What are their experiences with substance use? Like we now have an insight into the actual experience as opposed to making it up, (laughs) right? (laughs) Like, um, and, you know, while, while those of us with lived expertise and experience are like part of this agency, we should also be clear that like my experience was many years ago in a different part of the country. And so while I understand certain things, there are like key uh, subtleties or, or, or um, specific elements, right. That like, I'm not going to know. And this amount of data allows us not just to say, Oh, well, you know, I heard from one person, but like, I will be able to say at a frequency of 90%, Mm -hmm. 550 people say this, right. That's usable data. In designing services and responses, right? Yep. You mentioned um, folks that are uh, living unsheltered and they might be experiencing the criminal legal system. A, a long conversation in Seattle of that that door of folks that you know are, are chronically homeless, committing misdemeanors in some cases, felonies, sort of spinning through the system for a variety of reasons at a much higher rate than you know the the general public. Mm-hmm. What do we do about that portion of the population that's that's homeless, but experiencing 
a lot of interaction with the criminal legal system? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think, you know, uh, for me, that answer is is a two-parter. The first part is I feel that we should never uh, downplay the amount of victimization that people experiencing homelessness, particularly chronic homelessness, Mm -hmm. uh, experience. And that victimization often takes the form of being paid or or threatened into committing crimes, mm-hmm. right? Like, and, and, you know, it, it is, um, it's dark, but like, but very true that like people will, will give folks experiencing homelessness a hundred bucks and say, run into the target on second Ave, steal a toaster. And if you come back out, you know, I'll give you another hundred, right? Yep. Like, um, these are, are real things that happen. Um, and so there does have to be, um, a level of, of our intervention that is focused on that diagnostic, right? Of like, are people experiencing homelessness the arm of something that is, uh, uh, you know, more malevolent? Mm-hmm. Um, and can we identify that malevolence and and address it appropriately, right? The second part of, of the answer, uh, which, you know, is is simply that I've, I started my career in, in um, uh, youth violence, gang violence in particular in Massachusetts. And the governor asked us to structure a program uh, specifically focused on interrupting gang violence, you know, where we knew there was gang violence, right? Because we had these risk tiers, right? There was at risk and high risk and kind of at risk, but over there. <laughs> um, and the governor was like, no, I want a program for people who I know <laughs> are driving violence in communities, Right. And so myself and um, and uh, two other team members, uh, along with the assistant secretary at the time, invented a category, because you can do that when you work for the government, um, called proven risk. And it was basically our way of saying, like, we're just going to target the kids who we know are doing stuff, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and, you know, and I say that because, like, I, I want to— I think it's important for your listeners to know, and I, I have no problem. Like my my views on on um, policing are are documented. I'm not afraid of talking about them, but I also want to be clear. Like I'm also not like everyone is an angel. <laughs> like, that's not my mm-hmm. perspective. And so what we found is that for those young people who are committing violent acts, and and I want to be super clear when I say violent acts, like you know shootings, felony larceny, like you know these these were significant acts. What we found is that when we approached uh, their behavior through a public health lens um, and said, how do we identify what's missing in your life? And then how do we uh, basically incentivize pro-social behavior mm-hmm. instead of antisocial behavior? Like, that was pretty easy to write that ship, right? Easy being, you know, it was very hard. But it was easy in the sense that, like, you know, it was doable, right? Um, so we designed programming that we rolled out across 11 cities um, that was focused on taking these proven risk uh, young men and connecting them with, you know, the five pillars of youth development and pro-social activity. So, like, you know, we were like, hey, let's get you connected to education, whether it's vocational training mm-hmm. or high school. Let's get you a GED, like something in that domain. Let's get you connected to something therapeutic. I I was like, I don't care what it, it can be art. It can be you go to therapy, like whatever, right? Just like something that's about your feelings, mm-hmm. right? Let's make sure that your housing is set. Let's, like, talk about food, right? Like, let's talk about, like, connection to caring adults. Like, and and when we started looking at those domains uh, and then incentivizing them, and that was the other thing, right, is, like, we we would offer young people a stipend for program participation, right? So it's, like, we we acknowledge, like, hey, you don't have any money. (laughs) And a lot of this is because you don't have access Mm -hmm. to the economic uh, connection, right? So we we would provide a stipend for you to go to Voc Tech, right? And then you graduate, you're a journeyman, you don't need the stipend anymore, but providing the stipend kept you out of the gang while you were doing that, right? Because what we didn't recognize is that the gang was a job. And like, this is the thing that I, you know, I just, again, when we talk about the economics of violence or the economics of homelessness, right? Like, I think we do a poor job of recognizing just how intense it is to have no money in this country Mm -hmm. and how rapidly anything comes on the table if it's gonna get you money, right? And so for those folks who are engaged in, you know, significant recurring patterns of, of criminality, my question would be, you know, can we design, uh, programming one that identifies folks 
then three, uh, then two, you know, creates a a um, you know a a more detailed understanding of like who is this person, what are their needs, et cetera, and then three begins to create incentivized pathways to access other things, right? And and I think that like you know, uh, and and frankly, we can show in the in the math, right? Like it costs less money to pay folks to to go to Vogue Tech to access therapy to you know set them up to re-engage with pro-social dimensions of mm-hmm. society than it costs to run them through the criminal legal system six ways to Sunday over and over and over and over and over again, right? So that would be my suggestion there. You know, we have a limited role there. I think that, you know, we can certainly, through support of uh, some of the, the folks that we fund, right, like begin to intervene but, you know, much of that will require, and I look forward to some of these partnerships, right? Like partnership with prosecuting attorney, city attorney's office, et cetera. And once we are a little bit more stable inside our portfolio and our, our you know, our stuff is headed in the direction we want it to go, we'll start making some of those partnerships more active. Well, the word that stood out to me is intervene versus ignore, which is in some ways what we've been doing for many years is just sort of ignoring it versus trying to understand and diagnose and intervene in some appropriate way to change the behavior and in some cases the impact that some folks are having on themselves and the neighborhood or yeah. the small business or whatever. We dropped non-fatal shootings in um, a plurality of our communities by above 60%. Ju- just mm-hmm. by taking a very narrow a narrow and focused look at who was driving mm-hmm. the activity mm-hmm. and then saying, how do we assist them with the underlying issues here? A smart application of resources, it sounds like. So as we uh, as we wrap up, and and since this is kind of a, a there's a milestone question I get asked because you have been in the role a year. What's a what's a, your proudest moment in sort of in starting to build this startup, and what's a lesson learned from this last year that you'll carry forward? A leadership lesson. Really good question. <laughs> um, I think my proudest moments, if I can choose two, were the two severe weather incidents because they happened right after we took formal control, right? So like January 1, like, yes, we, we, I started building everything April 26th of 2021, but we didn't take formal control of the system, the money, the contracts, the, all that, the the stuff until January uh, of this year. Um, And we took formal control during a significant weather incident, right? It was that, that uh, week of, of, are we in Alaska where, you yeah. know, it was like the twenties during the day and it would plunge uh, into the, the teens and single digits at night. And we had significant wind. And, uh, and then uh, I think like three weeks later, we had another severe weather incident and all of that was happening during the COVID surge. Mm-hmm. And so it was just, it was a real, like that entire time was like just trial by fire. Mm-hmm. Right. It was like, there was no time to analyze a thing. There was, it was, you either know what you're about to do or you don't. And, and I think we did a really good job. I, you know, I think we could, like, we can always do better with severe weather. We saw a lot for where we're going to make improvements. And, and some of that will be reflected in some of our budget asks for this year. But I'm really proud of this team um, and how we were able to show up during that and support um, the whole county. You know, my sub-regional planning manager, Alexis, like, had uh, sub-regional check-ins every day with every region. Mm. And, you know, I I was really focused on Seattle and Seattle Metro. And then we would meet in the evening to, like, cross-debrief and be like, okay, so who needs, who mm-hmm. needs what? We were heavily engaged with our provider community and outreach folks and the Lived Experience Coalition, like, hearing, like, okay, so, like, you know, for folks who are sheltering in place, what do they need and how do we best support them? And I just think that that was... I think that was good work. And, you know, during during the, the COVID surge, right, we reconfigured an entire bay at the Soto shelter to be a, a sub-acute uh, clinical, you know, subclinical facility for people who, like, were uh, experiencing COVID symptoms but, you know, didn't need to go to INQ or to hospital but needed to be moved away from the rest of, like, and we, you know, arranged transit. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it so, like, we did a lot of stuff in that moment that, I just think this team has a lot of, um, and it's unsung stuff, right? Like no one wrote that up and like, you know, that's fine. But like, I'm really proud of how the team showed up in those moments and the work that we did. What am I taking forward? Um, I'm not from here, John. And, <laughs> and there has been, 
a fun sort of like cultural learning curve. <laughs> <laughs> and like one of the things that I I am going to step forward with is like, and this is like a little bit of a um, reverse cultural lesson. There was a moment in the last couple months where for a, a, a series of reasons best discussed during a happy hour, I just tried to be from here. Like I try, I tried to like be like, okay, well, like if this is how they like to communicate and this is how they want to do things, then like I'll do that. <laughs> Terrible mistake. <laughs> Awful. It, like it was like, you know, it resulted in me being inauthentic, you know, my strategies, like I don't know how to operate in some of those mm-hmm. things. And so like my strategies were all off. Like, you know, I, I was, I was, I just was like not like not nailing it. <laughs> and and, you know, I think the leadership lesson there, which is, you know, a little bit silly and a little bit Pollyanna, but it's just like, don't try to be somebody else, mm-hmm. right? Like, um, and for better or for worse, I am the person who has this job and I am, you know, a queer, black, non-binary, bipolar, PTSD having Michigander who like kind of doesn't know how to lie. And like, that's just who I should stay. <laughs> And like, if that means that I ruffle some feathers, I ruffle some feathers. But I think that I'll, I, I can help this team land where this agency is headed better if I stay that person than try to be somebody else. Um, and so that's what I'm really reflecting on as we step into budget mm-hmm. and, you know, everything that that waits for us on the other side. Speak your truth and connect with your intuition, right? Yeah. Just hold fast. Final question. What's your... Uh, What's your perfect Saturday in Seattle? Oh, wow. Okay. So um, I think my perfect Saturday, it is 69 degrees or 70. But like, you know, it, it, I got to get above 65. Like, I, I, need, I need that. <laughs> Which I don't think we've done this year. No, yet. we haven't. You're still waiting. <laughs> I'm really, I'm, your perfect I'm Saturday. clinging. The rest um, of us. And, uh, and I uh, would like um, to... Uh, ride my bike down from the hill to the waterfront and then ride along the waterfront. And then you can like, there's a, there's a back pathway that like loops up and takes you through some park and then up into Magnolia. And then you can get to um, uh, discovery. Um, And so like that, that's just, I've been waiting for the opportunity to do that. I have it clearly mapped out. (laughs) And I am waiting for that day. And then like along the way, right? Like you stop, you have a mimosa, you eat some French fries, right? Like one of my favorite places in in Belltown closed down, but there are many others that I cannot wait to spend money at. (laughs) Love it. Well, maybe this Saturday. I don't know what the the forecast is. I think it's south of, uh, at least as we're recording this today, south of uh, 65. I don't think we're going to go 65. Might might be. But the weekend after. Yeah. Yeah. We're just holding out hope. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you like I started uh, as I started. You've been really generous with your time and accessibility to us as an organization as we uh, try to work with you and your great team around this crisis downtown, and uh, and generous today too. So I appreciate that, and uh, thanks in advance for the event you're going to do with us in another week or so. No worries. And uh, we're here to support you as we've uh, continued to say. And uh, I think failure is not an option when it comes to this. The entity, uh, the authority, and the and certainly the plan for downtown. So really you let us know how we uh, can continue to do that. Thank you, uh, and thanks for having me. Uh, I will say to to you and to any listeners, like we continue to be available to chat. I am more afraid of people who don't know what we're doing than people who do. Like disagree with me, but disagree with me yeah. about the real fact, yeah. right? Like so, if you're listening to this and you want to talk, reach out. There we go. Well, thanks, Mark. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed my conversation with Mark Dones. Uh, We at the Downtown Seattle Association will be doing everything we can to uh, support and partner with Mark and their team and the King County Regional Homelessness Authority as they take on this just critical task. We uh, will be the cheerleaders and uh, champions, but also partners for their effort. This is a, as I see it, a failure is no option type of initiative and and proposition here um, that we're embarking on as a community. We must make greater progress uh, on uh, addressing the crisis of homelessness than, than what we've been able to achieve over the last several years. I think that's what we're all hoping for and desiring. And uh, it's what the folks on the street that are suffering and have been suffering for so long deserve. So I'm optimistic about our abilities under the leadership of Mark and their team and the new approaches and best practices that are deploying and 
uh, this real centralized and coordinated focus around uh, this crisis, a crisis that existed prior to the pandemic and a crisis that's been made worse and been exacerbated by the pandemic. I'm optimistic about our abilities to, to make a greater difference in downtown and in other parts of our uh, community. As I do each episode here, I want to close out with a recommendation on uh, what you just can't miss in downtown Seattle. And uh, my recommendation in today's episode is Parties in the Parks downtown that the team at the Downtown Seattle Association, the Parks and Public Space team, are producing and putting on every Tuesday in Occidental Park, every Thursday in Westlake Park throughout the spring and summer. We're flooding these spaces with a range of activities 11 a.m. to 7 p.m., live music, happy hours, food trucks, mini golf from Flat Stick Pub, giveaways, uh, kids uh, activities, a ton of things going on in Occidental on Tuesdays, in uh, Westlake on Thursdays throughout the spring and summer. You can find all the details on loveseatown.com, which is our micro site that we've built, which is your go-to source for all the events and activities happening throughout downtown, loveseatown.com. Check it out for the parties in the park. Grab your colleagues and friends and uh, get outside and enjoy some of this warmer weather in some of our great outdoor spaces. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of Seattle City Makers, presented by the Downtown Seattle Association with support from James Cito and production by Spark Creative. Mm-hmm.